because now now you're there. How you doing, Pooh? I'm, I'm doing I'm doing good. What's happening? Yeah, I know we should have won. You oh, should have no. won. You know, you know, you know. I, I'm I'm thinking we should we might have won that game, but I thought I'm thinking the next two opponents going to be a little bit. Little, I thought they was going to be a little bit tough for us anyway. I thought that even if we would have got past Gonzaga, it would took so much out of us that the physicality of Baylor would have wore us down. Yeah, you could be right, but we have been on a roll. We've been playing really well. Yeah, but we haven't played. We, we've been playing well, but when you got a combination of great athletes from an athletic standpoint, not great basketball players, but great athletes who know how to play, that's a little different than playing against Guys who know how to play, but not great athletes. Who do you think is going to win tonight? I think I. Uh, that's a tough call, but I, I do think if um, if Baylor Baylor can't be as aggressive as they have been in the in the tournament, because I think they're going to call it a little tighter in the championship game. Um, and if Baylor not patient, I think they'd be in trouble, especially if they pick up early fouls. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to be about how the referees allow them to play. If they can play aggressive like they 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 are, um, Gonzaga may be in trouble. But you know Gonzaga is tough, man. They uh, right. they tough. They share the ball. They know how to play. They execute. So it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. You got to stay keep your head on the swivel. They make back cuts. They cut and screen. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of times when you have athletic teams that's a little bit aggressive, they become overly aggressive and make those mistakes. A, a big uh, moment last night or the other night was when UCLA had the dunk and it got blocked at the rim and they just ran as fast as they could and had that easy way up down the other end. It was like a four point swing and it really hurt UCLA because UCLA was about to pull away and it was a great block. And it's just, you know, I mean, that's how close we were to winning that game. Yeah. But you know, when you six, nine and you go up the dunk, you know, you don't get blocked. Not right. if it's not another six foot, 6'11", 6'10", 7-foot guy there. Uh-huh. If it's a 6'1 guy, you, you're supposed to dunk that with major authority, right. especially when you're left-handed and the ball's on the left-hand side. You right. don't let no one come across and go get that. That's No, you don't ever. I don't, I don't care. You go up with mean intention, like to tear the rim off. Right. And by the way, if, if nobody knows, Pooh Richardson was in the NBA for 10 years. He it was the leading assist man at UCLA all time. And three point shooting percentage. You you got you you have a higher percentage than Reggie. Is that right? Percentage wise, yeah. But he took more. He took more. That's right. <laughs> yeah. He took a volume. He took a lot more. He's got volume. When you yeah, when you take more, you got you. There's more chances of missing. <laughs> that's right, and that's what I say, especially with three, because it's so far out. <laughs> Can't argue that. <laughs> but but Can't you argue a, that at all. You made over forty six percent from out there. That's pretty amazing, really. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> not bad at all. Not bad not, at all. Not, 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 not bad on a guy who had to actually learn how to do that. <laughs> was it natural for me in that, that regard? Mm-hmm. And then, and what was it like being, you know, the, the, you were the first pick for an expansion team as a rookie coming together, a whole brand new team. What was that like? Man, it, it you know, it had, it has a pros and cons. The pros were, you know, a lot of people think it's just bad because, you're on a new team and it's, it's brand new and, and you're going to do, and you guys are going to lose and, and you got to get used to that stuff. Um, it was, it was the, the pros of it was the fact that I get the chance to play early and establish myself where a lot of rookies got to come in and sit a year or two. Uh, I had a chance to play right away. Um, even though I felt I deserved to play right away because I, I earned it. Um, so, you know, I, I think that and the cons to it was that, you are playing in a new team. Uh, you're playing on a new team. And you got a team full of guys who was like the sixth, seventh, eighth man on other teams. And they come to this team. They figure out it's a new, it's a new start for them. And they want to reestablish themselves. So a lot of times the competition becomes internal. And, 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 they don't be, and it's not separated as who's who, who's expect what, whose role's what. Because no one has a role because everyone's trying to, you know, establish themselves. Me as a rookie, me as a rookie, you know, to show that I belong. And those guys who were on teams, they want to prove people wrong. They should be should be guys who should have been getting playing time. So, you you, you know, that was kind of delicate itself because you want to see those guys be successful. 
but at the same time, not at the expense of you. Right. Especially if you was you the franchise pick guy, you know. And if you don't, if you as a coach, if you don't want to create any separation, not saying that, you know, I'm better, even though I was, but not to say that it was uh you have to do it that way. We just have to put things in this perspective and say, okay, this is who we drafted, this is the direction we're going in, but you guys are gonna have an opportunity to be successful as well. We all gonna go together and this and that, you know. That's how you handle that situation. You just don't let everybody do what they want to do and and no direction. And then when you speak about it, everyone would be mad like you're saying something wrong. But, you know, I'm honestly telling you the truth. I mean, that's how you build franchises, you know? Yeah. You were the, the first pick ever for the Wolves, right? 10th pick overall. Yes. Yes. And that was um, – you played there for a couple of years and then you went – Yes. You went to the to- Pacers – I went to the Pacers, yeah. Right, and then the Clippers. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I remember you with all those teams. I used to go see you all the time, and, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You would get me yeah. tickets once in a while, so I used to have a, yeah. a great old time. You know, you were great, great to me. You were great every time to me. We, every time we come to the, the, uh, Jersey or the Knicks, you you oh. there, man. See Rob, come see, Rob, he remembers. I, I can count on you. That's great. Count on you being there. Count on you being there. You be right there. I'll I was like, always there. How in the hell did he get down to the four? <laughs> I, uh, I thought the same thing, but then we went to a Brooklyn Nets game. It was like, how are we hanging out with the players right now? How did this happen? We're yeah, just he there. Gets, he gets on the floor, man. He's on the floor. And, uh, I, I like, how do you get on the floor, bro? Oh, you know, <laughs> oh, man. Thanks for I'm the still tickets, trying to man. figure thanks it out. For t- you know, thanks for the tickets. <laughs> I, yeah, but I, I, didn't give you, I didn't give you four tickets. Hey, man, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> no, I got to tell you. And Just you're, get him you know, in the building. Yeah, and, 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 and you remember Jack Haley. He used to get me passes yes. tickets every night. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, he yeah. was a net. I used to. I remember one night. This is a true story. Mm. When he was with the Bulls, he was on that 72 win team. Yes. And I, and I go downstairs and used to be able to watch shoot around no matter where you sat right underneath the basket at the time. And right. I, go, I go, Jack, it's Bob. It's Bob. And he's looking and he goes, Bobby Speen, come out here. I go, no, there's a guard. He goes, don't worry about the guard. You come here. So I'm standing there mm-hmm. and he's running around me, Duncan, Jordan, and Pippen. I'm just standing there looking at him. I'm like, Whoa. <laughs> I go, people would kill for this. And I'll tell you what he, he was. That's right. And he, he was with um, the Nets twice, the Bulls. With Jordan, mm-hmm. he was with San Antonio with David. So I got to meet all the stars. Yeah. <laughs> Magic, he was with the Lakers for a year. Yeah, I got to meet Magic Johnson. And I mean, but yeah, he would. I, the first time I went to see him when he first got with the Nets, I saw him and he's kind of waving. And I come out, he walks me out to the court. He goes, "You want my autograph?" I go, "No, I want your phone number, so I can come back and see you again." <laughs> <laughs> it was all okay. And he just said, "Whenever you need it." He wasn't kidding because he did. Oh yeah, no doubt. No, Jack, was, no Jack, was, Jack is Jack has always been man. He was um, and he's so missed. He was always loyal dude, man. Yeah, he's just loyal, loyal dude, man. To no end. When Jack, when Jack Haley is with you, man, he's with you. I mean, even when you're wrong, he's with you. I mean, like, I never seen a guy right. like that ever. Right, he's loyal, and mm-hmm. he's. I I remember one night uh, where I guess it was Rolando Blackman beat the Nets on the last shot. And the Nets were winning the whole game, and I'm with my friends, and you know he got me past. So I went in the back after the game, and he goes, "Spino, I don't want to, I don't want to talk. We just walk." And he just walks past me, and before he walks out the door, <laughs> before he walks, he looks back and goes, "You want tickets when we come back off the road?" I go, "Well, yeah." He goes, "That's okay." <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a true story. That is a true story. Yeah, but that, that's uh, that's just you know, testament what kind of guy he was. Oh, Not yeah. only that, the uh, the love that we all have for your brother, that we still have for your brother. Yeah, um, we're trying to get him on my show. He won't come on. That's what that's what all that's what's all about. You know, you know, you know, Speed Dog. You know how he roll. Speed yeah, Dog do. don't roll Speed like dog. that. He, you know, he ain't, he ain't roll like that. You know, he uh, he won't he won't. He Take don't mean credit. anything by he won't mean anything by it. But he he's not gonna want to get in front of the camera and, and do all that. That's not Speed Dog. That's not him. Um, you know, what's funny, uh, I, you know, because he's really behind me on this show and we really want to get it going. So if you know anybody, get Dr. J on my show, we'll, we'll really take off. But, but, <laughs> but, right. but, but um, he said the players, I told him how many players I had on so far. And he goes, really? And Larry Farmer called him and he goes, boy, Bob's show is really fun. And, and uh, so we said, you know, well, I'm glad it's going well, but I got one question to go. What's that? He goes, do they mention me? 
I go, they mention you all the time. Oh, they everyone, every every single guest is talking about Tony. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, yeah. that's the that's the link to it all, you know? That's the he, link to it all. And yeah, he's, he's a he's great, great guy, you know, always took always, man, always taking care of me. Even when it was when I was out of school and and in the summer and if I needed mm-hmm. to come to the training room to get stuff, you know, I'd come in and he he, you know, put me on a machine or he had a massage, he'd do stuff. You know, I mean he's a solid class A guy. You know what I'm saying? I, oh yeah. And he's really good at what he does. Uh, he really, really Oh is. yeah, he, he he loves it. He loves it. Right. He loves and, it. And that's why I want him to come on. I'm like, I think the world should know now. And he's like, oh, I don't gotta come on. I don't gotta come on. You know? Yeah, that's him. That's him. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's him. That's him. You so know, you, that's just who he is. So you grew up in Pennsylvania, right? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Uh-huh. Right. Why don't you tell us about that a little bit? Uh, you know, I grew up actually in South Philadelphia, right near the uh, sports complexes. Sure. I actually used to walk to the sports complexes. I no lived kidding. Uh, no kidding. literally 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes from the airport. You know how you come into Philadelphia in an airport? Yeah, and then you I've, see, I've been on you, it. You, in you it. see those, you see when you cross that bridge, you see them oil tanks, those oil tanks that got the yes. fire. Yes. I yeah. live right over there. In that Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, Syracuse has done great with Philly guys. Did they ever try to recruit you? I was recruited extremely hard by Syracuse, uh, but go, they, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it it wasn't. See, they went after Philly guys. That was. I, there was none that went before I did. Because I, I was on the early boat. I was on the. You know, I was on that. I was in that eighty-five class. Mm-hmm. So they, they were getting guys from Philly after that. You know. Um, it was one person who was at Syracuse at the time and she played basketball, a, a lady by the name of Jadine Day, who I knew for a long time. She's out of West Philly and um, I knew her from playing in uh, leagues and stuff around Philly. And um, she was the only person that was from Philly that was was at Syracuse at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it my- seemed like after I didn't go, Bayheim just went. He went crazy in Philly, didn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah. The most exciting player I've ever personally seen in college was Akeem Warwick, the Philadelphia Flyer. That guy could jump out of his skin. I, I swear the guy could probably dunk from the three-point line in his prime. I mean, unbelievable uh, guy. <laughs> Hakeem Warwick. He played a few years in the oh, NBA. Yeah, Hakeem Warwick. Unbelievable. Yeah, Hakeem Warwick. I know Hakeem. Mm-hmm. I know Hakeem. Yeah. Yeah, the Philadelphia Flyer, yeah. they called him. Oh yeah, that was him. Hakeem yes. Warwick. Yeah, he was in. He was on. He was on that team with Melo, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. he had the. Uh, he had the, that, ga- the game, game saving block at the end after he missed a foul shot uh, to save yeah, the game. He w- yeah, he played. He played with Melo. Yeah, yeah. He also Hakeem posterized Warwick, the Texas Duncan player machine. in the semifinal. <laughs> oh yeah, he had Duncan. He dunk. He had Duncan machine. Duncan machine, man. Right. He was unbelievable. So, uh, mm-hmm. you think you can get Melo on for us? Well, I could reach out to him and see what he's doing. You know, those guys in season, you know, it's got to be the timing. It's all about their timing. You know, the timing. they got time. Sure. They, they definitely have time. It's all about the timing for uh for those for those guys. Like I was uh talking to Kyle Lowry the other day, and we was talking about some stuff because you know he's from he's from down my way too. Mm-hmm. So we was talking about, you know, just basketball and stuff like that, and how the pandemic stuff is throwing things off and how guys are leaving teams to go to other teams and it's, it's just getting crazy. Yeah. How about that? Right. People can just jump, hop, hop a team and, you know, just go a different team and start the next year. Pretty wild. Yeah. Uh, in college. Yeah. College. Yeah. You know, I, I know there have been some questions about that, some discrepancies, but man, you know, at the end of the day, and I hate to say it, and they talk about this, uh, this, uh, the, um, the uh, transfer portal. Um, and right. I've been listening to a lot of people talk about it from different talk shows. And I listen to talk shows in my car and stuff like that. Um, some people, you know, majority of people that's in the business and college says it's going to change the way college sports are looked at and it's going to change these things. But man, you know, the coaches do it all the time and they do it for money. Right. Exactly. Right. What's good for they the goose, the good for the gander. Man, you know, they do it and they do it for money. It's not, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's not like, think about this. If you would leave school 
and you had two years left on your scholarship, whatever that, whatever that amounts out to be, you're not taking that with you. Right. That means that now there's two more years of money that's freed up for them to give the scholarship to someone else. Just like you two guys might be leaving you, two guys could be coming. Right. Because right. how many times have the guys, well, think about this, man, and you, and you got to look at it. This is why a lot of times you, I tell youngsters, you know, when you make a decision to go to college, make sure that you can live there. That's a place that you can live, a place you can have a job at, a place you can get up every day and be glad you're there and work and do whatever because if basketball doesn't work out. Because when they recruit you, they tell you everything you want to hear. Then once you get there, it could be a different, a different situation. And not only not blaming the, the coaches, Maybe because, you know, when a coach recruiting you, he's recruiting you normally a, a three to six month period. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really know you. No. So now once you get to the campus and you're there and you don't really know the coach, the coach really don't know you and you guys are going off of what you guys talked about doing recruiting and how much of that recruiting is just real and how much of that recruiting is just recruiting. Um, now, once you get there, once you get there, right, once you get to the school, you know, the coach might not, you know, like, like your style of ball, might not like your work ethic. It could be anything. Sure. So what do you do? Sit you on the bench, don't play you, recruit over you, your career is over. How about if, if I'm in a situation like that and I say, okay, well, I can always go back to Philly and play people who do know me sure now if they want to give me a scholarship to come back then i'm gonna come back as in case johnny juzang oh boy what do you think johnny juzang johnny juzang should have never went to kentucky he can't run and jump like those guys no but he can play basketball they, and you found a home with us i can tell you that he's a skilled player yeah he's a skilled player not saying that kentucky guys aren't skilled players but Kentucky draft skilled super athletes. Yeah. James Zang is not a super athlete. He's a basketball player. He's a That's skilled right. player who That's has right. to be in a system right. that provides, uh, that requires a lot of fundamentals and he can shoot the ball. And if on a college level, if you can shoot the ball, you can get a chance. Absolutely. Uh, you know what? And Kentucky, maybe outside of Anthony Davis, really never really had too many fundamental players. I mean, they really are kind of uh, above the rim, you know, and, and three-point shots, which, you know, I, I don't mind three-point shots, but sometimes I think they overuse them, you know? Well, that's the, that's the nature of the game now. I know. I don't, but just because it's the nature doesn't mean it's right. You know, I don't know if it's right. Well, I, you know, realistically, um, I don't know if it's a right or wrong way to play it. Mm -hmm. I mean, to certain coaches, it's all about winning. And if you, you win... They don't care how you do it. They don't care how you do it. A lot of people don't. Be, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're yeah, breaking up a little bit, but a little uh, bit breaking up, but you're fine. So I gotta, I gotta throw a couple more Philly names at you, Pooh Richardson. Uh, Rick Jackson, Scoop Jardine, yes. and Deion Waiters. Do you know all three of them? Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> can can you get them on the show, do. please? <laughs> Rick is from. Rick, Are they Rick all Syracuse from? Rick, Rick's from Rick's from North Philly. Uh, Scoop, Scoop is from South Philly, and um, Dion is from South Philly, and I'm from South Philly. Uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you a crazy story if you ever want to hear a story. Oh, I, uh, I'm all ears. So Scoop Jardine, when he came out, I was the one training him, getting him ready when Utah took him in and he broke his foot. Mm. That was a bummer. Yeah. Uh, because he was working so hard. Uh, we trimmed up. We trimmed about twenty five pounds over the summer. Uh -huh. um, turned it. Turned it. Turned it. You know. Turned it into some muscle. Um, had him playing really well. Man, I had him playing really he was well. So good. Uh, and he went to Utah and he broke his foot. He was going to make that team. He, mm -hmm. I no doubt about it. I wouldn't be surprised in the least. Now the now other crazy story, right? Now, I grew up in an area right right near the airport. Like I was telling you guys. Uh, an area called Pass Young Projects. I grew up in that project. It was a guy named Dion. Is a, is a, it was a guy named James Waiters. His little brother was Dion Waiters, hmm. who was Dion Waiters' daddy. 
How about that? Right. <sighs> Small world. So Dion Waiter's father was like a little youngster living in my project. <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. A little youngster living in the pro- That's amazing. His dad, his dad was. His, his uncle, James Waiters, we used to call him Dooch. He used to hang with me all the time. Wow. That's incredible. That's, that's great. And, Sco- and now Scoop and Dion were pretty close growing up, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. I, I think we yep. ought to get a we ought to get a Syracuse show on where you could just bring all the guys on and Rob will go crazy because he oh, went to school. I'll just lose my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he would. Yeah, I think I think uh, a matter of fact, I think Scoop is doing some uh, some grassroots work with the Nike, right? If I'm not mistaken. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. I think that's exactly what he's doing. Yeah. Now, when when you uh, went to Europe, um, you played for Kobe and Kobe's father on a team, or they asked you to play for them. Yeah, they asked me to go over there. and You know, they just bought the team. They wanted me to go over. I was already done playing. They wanted me to go over there and play a little bit and help manage the team a little bit. So I went over for that year to Milan. Right. And yep. what I, I remember seeing his father when I was a little kid. My brother me, was in the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah Joe. And um, the Bucks. I remember flying. We actually flew on the road trip. I was on the plane with the players. <laughs> wow. Never, never wow. mind the court. Yeah. <laughs> but because we used to go all the time when I was in high school, you know, for Christmas vacation to Milwaukee right. for two weeks. And then we right. flew. And then, you know, the next day there was D- Daryl Dawkins. He was a rookie and you know, right. Dr. J. And and uh, Joe was on that team. And that team, yes. that team wasn't very good. But that one year where they were just terrible, they were like nine and 73, you know. But that was a lot of fun. It was it was quite an adventure, you know. Right. Right. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So I have to ask you the question, unfortunately, that I ask everyone that's coming on here. And the question is, what is the greatest what might have been for you in your career, be it college or pro? You know, the, 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 the game, the series, the team you were with, what should have happened? Glory should have happened that just didn't. Um, I think better management in Minnesota. Cause I should have played my whole career there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? They were an expansion team too, though. So you kind of, you kind of got to uh, expect it a little bit, but yeah. Right. Right. Just, a, just a little bit, but you know, when, when, you know, I just think, I just think it was just, it was so, it's so, it's so easy to do the right thing than it is to do goofy stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where that's where you know my discrepancies came in at because you know they were doing a lot of stuff that was crazy man it just just didn't make sense you know but you know when you don't own an organization you, you know you got to play by the rules right now is that the team you like playing for the best or the best i don't know i don't know if i have anything in the best i mean you're in the, you're in the nba <laughs> right that's everybody's, the best everybody all of it is fun you know, I didn't, I didn't, right. I, you know, you get good, good teammates and, and uh, great com- right. camaraderie. And, and I mm-hmm. think, I think I, I got to say the best time had to be Minnesota because it was new. Uh, we were, we were having wreck out records, sell out, sell out crowds. Yeah. Um, we didn't, we, and this was just before we moved into the target center um, because we was at the Metro Dome the first year. Okay. Uh, we had so many people. You know, we played in front of the sixty-eight thousand against Boston. Um, I mean, we just we it was it was like the town was new, and during that time, everyone was coming to Minnesota because Flight Time Music and Prince and those guys was taking off. A lot of people was coming to town to do their music. Sure. With, uh, with, with from- Flight Time, but Jerry Jam and Terry Lewis and those guys, right. Janet Jackson was spending time in in in, in Minnesota. It was nice. It was really nice. Right. Right. Prince is from Minis- was from Minnesota, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mars Day in the time. All those guys was up in Minnesota at the time. Yeah. Oh, right. What so was it, the had, way- it just had so much potential. It just it, it really yes. never has lived up to it. it right? Never. 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 Mm-hmm. You know, you know, and I'm, I don't, you know, I don't knock, I don't knock it, but everything they would do in the front office perspective was always internal. Either you played at University of Minnesota, you lived it, you was from Minnesota. They never really reached outside that circle. 
for for those who wasn't, you know, like who who knew that you've been in the NBA for so many years and and understood and and all these things. We never we never extended an olive branch to nobody like that. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, like it's just like your Clippers. It's just like the Clippers until right. Doc Rivers uh, came there. There were no ex players in the organization whatsoever. Right. I don't know how you do that. Well, yeah. you're not a you're not you know, you're not a, you're not an expansion team. Right. Well, the Clippers were a, a, a different. Let's just put it that way. They who knew what they were really doing half the time. You know. Right. Um. Now I got a question. I'm a big Celtic fan growing up. So what's it like to play against Larry Bird? Well, you know, fortunately, love for me in two ways. Fortunately enough, I didn't have to play against him full strength. And right. fortunately enough, I was out, had an opportunity to be on the court with him at the same time. By the time I was a rookie, he was having back issues. He was at the uh-huh. end of his rope. He was at the end of his rope. But, you know, you would see flashes here and there. You knew he was great. You didn't need to see a lot. Right. Them and the Lakers must have been tough on you. Well, they were tough on everybody. But yeah. 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 And we're gonna we're gonna try to get on uh, Jamal Wilkes, you know, kind of kind of the forgotten Laker who was really great, you know. And oh yeah, well, the, the, he was the silent assassin for them. Yeah, that's right. Everywhere that's exactly he went, what you guys were talking. That's what Coach Farmer and you were both calling him. Right, uh, right, right. And and um, he uh, he actually just texted me during this show. So he's gonna come on on Thursday or Friday, one of those days. So. Um, well, we definitely want him on. And oh yeah, that's my man, Silky. Tell Silky I said hello. I sure will. I sure Silky. will. Silky. Yeah. Tell Silky. And, and one I day we'll get everybody. Smooth Silk. On. Uh, yeah. One day we'll get everybody on together. It'll be a heck of a show. But um, yeah, and you know, he told my brother. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it would. He told my brother um, that uh, Tony, I don't get no respect. I always have to play behind somebody great. First, it was Walton. And then, and then it was Kareem, you know, so he's always like that other guy. But boy, he was hardly that other guy. Other guy. He was amazing. But he still he still figured out a way to make it to the Hall of Fame. Jeez. Yeah. So, so he wasn't that bad. That's true. Well, you know, like and I've said this to Larry. <laughs> yeah. That night when, you know, Philly lost. Made it. To, yeah, that night when Philly lost to the Lakers. Um, he had 38 points that night the night when magic had the 42 and nobody, yeah. re- nobody remembers. Will. yeah, nobody, which is sad. You know, magic does. Oh yeah. I, I know he does. Ma- magic you magic does. don't, does you think magic mentions him a lot though? <laughs> mm, mm. He just wants you to know he had the 42. Don't ever forget that. Well, yeah. But, and that's the other question I ask everyone. Well, who who well, are the you know, unsung heroes, Jerome? The ones that don't get the accolades that really should. No, well, he's one. Uh, sure. And 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 uh, in in our years, um, I think um, for the Lakers, it was Jamal Wilkes, of course. Yeah, D- definitely, definitely for Boston, it was Cornbread Maxwell. Yes, definitely. yes. This, this this connection is brutal, man. I'm out here in Palm Springs area. It's brutal. Wow. Yeah, the the the, uh, the the ISP, your Wi-Fi provider, is uh, really really uh, not living up to speed here. <clears throat> yeah, you need you need an upgrade. Yeah, you need an upgrade. I, def, that, I, don't know, I think I got the highest I can get. I just think this area is just terrible. We'll see. Right. So what were you saying? Uh, you were talking about cornbread. Yeah, the, oh, the, the unsung I'll heroes. Cornbread, I throw cornbread for the Sixers, those great Sixers teams. I thought it was Mo Cheeks. Uh, right, right. Uh, um, um, you name the team, I can name you a guy that was significant, but people didn't talk about him that much. Orlando Magic. Yeah, of course. Orlando Magic. Um, I thought um, on on which those uh, those really like those the teams that they went all the way. The, the great, yeah, with, the great Dennis Scott, Nick Anderson, Shaq, Penny, Horace. I thought Anthony Bowie was. Oh, Bowie really? Was good. Yeah, he yeah. was good. Yeah, yeah. Well, well here, he about, came and he they played one, two, and three and defended. Well, how about this one? When, when uh, the Miami Heat won in 06, How about James Posey? How good yeah. was he? Yeah, 
Yeah. He was tough. And, and with yeah. the Celtics in 08. Yeah. He was yeah. big. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Definitely. guys guys like that. And you were right about cornbread. Wow. You know, he leads NC, he leads NC, um, UNC Charlotte to the final four. And if it wasn't for a, a shady call, they would have got to that final game and maybe won it. Right. And he and he was he was the MVP, as I just told Rob, of Larry Bird's first title in 81. He won mm-hmm. the MVP of the, of the finals. He was. And right. he used to have those putbacks and those N1s. He never missed a foul shot. He was so right. clutch. He was so clutch. Mm-hmm. He was so clutch. Yeah. And so and, we, oh sorry, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead, Rob. Oh, I was going to say, you know, as as you, all these kids want to be stars. So what right. do you have to say to the the kids growing, the kids coming about trying to learn the game, trying to prove themselves, who want to become you? Uh, what advice do you have for them? Keep working hard. Uh, believe in what you do. Um, make that the only thing that you do and the only thing that you want to do because that's, go- that's the only way you're going to give yourself a legitimate <laughs> chance. The last thing you want to do is uh, is play any kind of sport. I don't care if it's basketball, football, or going to any kind of job. And Moonlight want to do two different things because, you know, you need full dedication, especially when you're talking about sports. Right. You right. really have to have full dedication. Right. And with the, all the resources now that they have, the different segues you can get to the, to, to the NBA is far more than when I came in. I had to go the traditional way. Right. You know? You go to college for four years, go to high school, become an All-American, go to a great college that put out NBA players and go there for four years and then you 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 get drafted. I mean, it's it's so many outlets now and the scouting services and all these things these kids can be a part of. So all you got to do is be, you know, a pretty decent player that has some kind of focus and dedication. You're going to get an opportunity. Right. Do you think the players today are better than when you played? I think the better. I think today a few players are. I think today's players are better athletically. I right. don't know if they better basketball wise. You know, yeah. and, and like that's every, what that's what we're getting from everybody. And everything is and everything is in a category. Like for instance, you never you don't have point guards in my era that couldn't shoot a fifteen footer because you wouldn't be on the team because the bigs were dominant in the paint and you had to double them. And most right. most of the time you double with the guards. Um, because you were afraid that if you double with a big, the rebounds will be putbacks. Um, these guys are getting labeled, and I was just talking to a friend of mine about basketball. These guys are getting labeled as like two way players. Like, what the hell is that? You're supposed to play defense. I didn't never heard that. Right. You get credit to play. You now you're a two way player. Like, oh, so you do have just one way players? Right. It's funny you bring it up. Yeah, that's interesting. It's funny you bring it up because uh, I noticed now that. A lot of players today do cannot play two way. They're either offense or defense. And back when you guys played, everybody played both, and you were good at it. You I kind of noticed that. Yeah, you that had is true. To. That is true. Because well, one of the things was you wanted to get fourteen to twenty on your guy, and you wanted him to get ten or eight. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Not saying that that was going to happen every night, but that's what, what that was your goal. Your goal was to not let him get his average. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so they get credit now. They, you you special when you when you play defense now. Right. You're a and two-way then, guy. Yeah, you're a two-way. Yeah, right. When that's that's the game. You're supposed to be a two-way guy. So goes, that's what I thought. Yeah, well, that's kind of right. So I So mean, what they do now, they're gonna start subbing guys as soon as you as soon as you get off the offense and go to defense, they sub while you're running down the court <laughs> and they send a guy in like hockey. Uh yeah, kind of. Uh, maybe kind of. Yeah, kind of. You ain't a two way guy. You got to be right. two way, right? <laughs> right, and and that's another argument for the fact that you know the the players just aren't as good because if you're not a two way, then what are you? You're not as good. You should be. So right, I just think that you know athletically, they're much bigger and stronger and more athletic. I sure. think a few guys you have your elite guys who can probably play in any era, but most mm-hmm. of the guys that you see. <laughs> You know, a lot of guys, and I'm not knocking them guys who fill the bench and stuff like that, right. and they only could do one thing good. You know, those guys probably would never play as much or probably wouldn't make a team back then. That's what my brother – I said that. I go, so a lot of these guys wouldn't be in the league. And every the kids say today, the younger kids, oh, 
you know, they would have killed them. I go, are you kidding? A lot of these players today would never even made the league. And, you know, back then, since there were less teams, there was less roster spots. So only the better players got on the rosters. No question. And you had to be able to play offense and defense. That's right. You had to be good or you weren't getting into that league. And there was no, you know, all these other leagues to play in now. Right. Right. And And just from a fan perspective, it's not as entertaining to watch someone not try on a part of the game. (laughs) Right. Or not be able to, you know, effectively play it at a high level. Well, man, they got this thing called load management. What is that? What's this? What? They got the thing called load management. What is that? Oh, load it's management. Like, it's, it sounds like something you do on a computer. Oh, you played <laughs> one minute over the time we set for you. So come out of the game. We need to get you well, out. But, but when, in, my, in my day, guys never wanted to come out the game. That's right. That's right. And, and that sounds it's, like saying, dude, the pitch count. You throw 100 pitches, you're out. That's yeah, ridiculous. But, man, let me tell you. You take guy out the game, he moaning and groaning and mad at the <laughs> ref. He yeah. don't want to come out the game. No. No. Because I think the love, the love of the game and for the game was there unconditionally. I think a lot of guys love what the game brings to them. You know, the wealth, the attention, and all that stuff. And <clears throat> and, and they deserve every bit of it too, as well. Mm-hmm. But I think I just thought that the love for the game itself. During the era I was in and, and the era before me, I think that they just loved the game. They like always no, wanted to be on the court, always wanted to prove that they were good, and, and always, always like that kind of thing. No, you're absolutely right. That's very just, profound and very true. Well, you know, you know what, Poot, you're right because when we were kids, um, you know, you could be like best friends with somebody, but if they're on the other team for those couple of hours, oh, you, hated, going you hated their guts, yeah, right, like, like they're sure. enemies. You wanted to win. Yeah. I mean, and back then, you know, the players that played when you were in wanted to make money, but they cared about winning too. Don't kid yourself. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Now today, everybody's everybody else's friend. Let's make a buck and go home. That's pretty much it. You know? And, and you can rest assured that, you know, those top guys are not playing for nobody else. That's for sure. That's right. They're not trying to go somewhere else to play so they can be on a team with five that, other guys like yeah, them. They're yeah. not trying to do all that. They like, look, we doing it like this. Right. You Larry mean like Bird, Larry Bird is not playing for no one else. Right. Isaiah Thomas is not playing for no one else. Well, you, you, no, no, no. And, and you know what? I, I remember Xavier McDaniel saying this years ago. He said the first time when Bird was a rookie, I guess it was in Seattle, the game, because Xavier was there. And the whole game, because he was a trash talker too, not just Bird. Bird was a big right. one. But right. he kept saying, oh, rookie, you stink, you stink. And the whole game, you know, Seattle was originally was blowing you out, but Boston was so good, they came all the way back. And the game went down to the last shot. And, you know, Bird didn't answer back that night. You know, he was young. And so finally, when the last timeout came, when, when Boston called timeout, Larry didn't even get in the huddle. He walked over to the Seattle huddle. And he goes, hey, come here, jerk off. You know, you see this three-point line right here? They're going to give me the ball, and I'm going to hit the game when he shot in your face. How, how does that make you feel? And sure as heck, I don't watch that game. It was on, you know, TV at night. He turned around and hit that shot with no time left, and they won the game right in his face. And he just went, darn, you're pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, but, yeah, they wanted to win. I mean, they didn't play games, you know. That is true. That is yep. so true. So true. And besides that, you know, what do you think the game kind of needs? What's lacking? What's missing? Well, what what could really spice this thing up? I think uh, I think they I think um, I don't know if they call that development, but I think the bigs need to be back back close to the basket again. Yes, I think uh, yes, I think I think uh, that that will bring a, another dynamic to the game because now you're now you'll force more of the guard play to be enhanced because guys don't even know how to make an entry pass nowadays. No, they don't. So they don't know how to get to feed the big man where he wants it, how to lead him to the basket when they front him, how to lead him to make the, the bucket. They just don't know how to do these things because no guys play underneath the basket. So they out there shooting three pointers with you. Well, you know, like Mitchell Butler said this to me, he said that, you know, the players today don't like shooting in the lane, the little runners and, or with their back to the basket, and it's a different game. I go, yeah, but, but the coaches never really taught him how to do that. You know, 
and, and right. work work with them. They never worked on it themselves. And right. they need to learn how to redo that. And you know what? Once they start making baskets in the lane, they're going to start liking it a whole lot. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, you know, it's just, I, I really don't think coaches, like I'll, I'll say it again and I say it on every show, if you have a five-on-one fast break, why are three of those five guys pulling up behind the three? If we tried that when we were kids, we'd be sitting on the bench for a month, you know? Oh, for sure. You better cut to yeah. that basket, look for that bounce pass for that layup. And get That's exactly. And mm-hmm. You would know. You were the point guard. So, yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And I, what do you think about coaches today? Uh, you know, they're all good. You know, they, you know, everybody got their own style. I think. Uh, no, we lost him. Yeah, he'll be back. Yeah. So, it's a. Uh, Really get an old school take on everything. It's uh, it's this has been enlightening. It's not even like an old school take, Rob. It's the right thing. It doesn't matter what year that they played that way. It just doesn't. Right is right, and it could. I told you, Tim Duncan. They can say whatever they want about you know Kobe and all the, but Duncan won five times. He was the most fundamental, old fashioned guy out there, and he won. It that's the right way to play the game. The reason that high dunker, high flying dunkers win. It's because everybody does it. Somebody has to win every year. It's just like I, I make the argument, well, you don't need a center. Yes, you do. But nobody has one or wants to use them the right way. So somebody has to win a championship every year, no matter what. So naturally, the center's not going to win. Nobody's playing the darn position. So that's kind of it's kind of a dumb argument, really. You know? Yeah, I don't I don't see why the you know, everyone talks about how there's not really defined positions or roles anymore. Right. I don't know how helpful <laughs> that is. I think there's something to be said about you know, having the distinguished roles and fulfilling those functions. That's right. If, if you blur lines, then you're doing just that. You don't know where you are. You're confused. So you just have to, there has to be structure without structure. There's chaos. That's really it. You know what I mean? That's really it. And it's good that we're doing this show because nobody on ESPN. Yes, I am taking a hit at you guys. Nobody anywhere really talks about this. Incoming. Incoming. Yes, the train has arrived. But um, nobody's really talking about this stuff. And it needs to be talked about. It's just like what Mitchell said, Mitchell Butler. Somebody has to have the guts and the bravery to coach the right way and do the right thing. Because everybody thinks, well, this is the way now. Well, why do you settle for something that's not right? This is the way doesn't mean it's the right way. It's more important to be right and do it the right way than just any way. This is the way we do. So what? So that's just like saying, well, we all jump off bridges now just for fun. (laughs) Really? Please. Let's just do it the right way and don't jump off the bridge so we live to see tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? But (laughs) yeah. Don't jump off the bridge, folks. It's not the right way. No, no, it's not. It hurts a lot, but, but um, I also think there's something to be said about what Pooh Richardson mentioned with the, um, you know, is there really a right or wrong way? You know, you seem to think this is the right way. I, I agree with you. I just, you know, I, I wonder about that. You know, maybe, maybe it, it's just different now and it's not really wrong. Well, you know, I had an argument with a 15 year old at the, my pizzeria because he always delivers my pizza. And he said the same thing you just did. He goes, well, you know, you have a certain thing. No, because, again, that's blurring the lines. Because once something is right, look, that's just like trying to tell me that people think, well, the sun doesn't set in in the West. Well, no offense, Junior, but it does. And you can't change. It's right. So you can have all the opinions you want. You can think it comes, you know, it goes down in the the Northeast or whatever direction you want to pick. But, like... If it's if you're not saying West, you ain't right. So, I mean, it's just you have to know right and wrong. And unfortunately, it is blurred in, into sports. I'm, look, the hundred pitch count is not right. We'll change sports for a second. We're gonna go to baseball. The hundred pitch count's not right. It's not because um, you have to go have. And Mike Sosha agrees with me. You know, you have to have a feel for the game. If the guy's throwing a great game. And you just come out there and go, well, he's pitching a perfect game, but yeah, it's a hundred pitches. So it's time for you to leave the, you know, no, just ask, just ask Tampa Bay Rays. 
when they had uh, Snell on the mound last year against the Dodgers in the World Series. Let me tell you something. The Dodgers were scared before they took him out, and he was untouchable. And they just went, mm, 100 pitches, let's go. And I looked at the guy. I was out at the bar, and I looked at the bartender and went, oh, the Tampa Bay's up one nothing. They're going to lose the game 3-1. You watch. I no sooner got it out of my mouth. Home run, base it, home run. In the biggest moment of the entire franchise's yeah. history. Well, they were winning one nothing. I, I'm sorry, I, I said three, but it was three to one. That's what I told the guy. They're going to lose three to one, and that's exactly what they did. Because you know what? He goes, "Should I bet it?" And he pulled his phone. He was going to bet it right on the spot. I go, "I would." He didn't do it, but I. You know what? He came back and he goes, "I should have listened to you." It finished the game. Finished three to one, and that changed the whole World Series because the Dodgers were going, "Yeah, tomorrow we got them." You know, so, but. Because they were worried, they didn't want to play a seventh game. Mm-mm, because they had lost a couple seventh, they lost a seventh game to the Astros a couple of years ago. And that's the thing: how many more pitches would he have probably had to make after you know he hit the hundred mark? It's not. It's not about that. On certain days when you have it, you can go. Like certain other days, like it's funny because I've seen managers are so confused now because the lines are so blurred. I can watch a guy. I, I text my brother doing that World Series. Uh, the Dodgers um, were playing lousy in the first inning of one of those games. And I text him, I go, get him out of the game right now. And my brother goes, I go, I've watched so many games in my life. He does not have it. And my brother's like, oh, it's the first inning. Don't worry. Go, no, he's never going to get past the third. And he didn't. He got lit. You could see it. You got to go on feel sometimes and what's happening in front of you instead of always the stat book, the stat book. No, 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 no. And, and, you know, and, and they're actually taking pictures out of games that throw perfect games now. Those people need their head examined. There's something wrong there. You know, I mean, you go on feel. And that's why, you know, Sosha totally agrees. He's not a big analytics guy, and I hate it. I think it's ridiculous. I mean, to have some – to follow that – to follow a formula like that, like a pitch count, to such strict adherence. Yeah. It's just – it's a folly. I mean, okay. He pitched a hundred, but clearly he can keep going. He's on a roll. He has momentum. You're in, you have, a, you only have a one, uh, you only have a slim lead and everything is on the line. It's okay. If he keeps going. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and cause they, in the beginning, they used excuses like, well, it's a long season and we don't want to wear him out. He's a pitcher. He's supposed to pitch. He gets four days. He gets four days to rest. And in that case, it was the World Series, so it's not a long season yeah. left. No, that's right. It's two days. <laughs> you have two more days left, and that's it. That's it, it was yeah. Game Six. That was it. You know, I mean. So, but that's the excuse. When you do wrong things, what usually sets up the wrong thing is you justify it in your mind. You go, hmm. Well, I don't want to burn his arm out. Look, these guys are getting more hurt today than ever before. Tommy John, the old joke, and it's a true joke. Tommy John was the only one that had Tommy John surgery back in the 70s. Now, everybody has it. And so the 100 pitch thing is not saving their arm at all. And I think a lot, remember when I talk about this being a medical trainer, one of the things that give you this, you know, to have that elbow go and, and is weightlifting. They overdo it because even though the body gets strong, the elbows do not, and it crushes the elbows. They over and, and the way they release the ball, snap, bam, rubber band breaks. So, you know, they, and they're doing it to themselves, and they don't even know. And my brother's like, "Stop lifting." We tell them all the time, "Stop lifting weights. Stop it. You do, you're overdoing it." And and they don't rest enough. They think you go to go every day. You got to rest too. That's really important. And you know, if not equally important than the exercise, I'll tell you why I. I um, I hate the Yankees. If anybody doesn't know that, I grew up a Mets fan. And what used to happen is there was this guy in the seventies named Rick Waits, who became a co- I think he was a pitching coach with the Mets and Yankees at one time when he when he retired. But he was a great pitcher with the Cleveland Indians. He would come into games when he was a lefty, a slow lefty, and the Yankees couldn't hit him for seven innings. And then the seventh, eighth inning comes, and he would give up this ground ball, and it would sneak through. It would always happen. It would sneak through the hole with two outs and, you know, nobody on. Base hit. So the manager thought, oh, he's getting tired. To me, that was the early stages of the 100-pitch count. Instead of looking at the guy going, no, don't take him out. He's rolling. 
you know? Oh, okay. But the Indians used to have what they used to call the kerosene crew. You know how the, they would have the relief pitcher being the fireman to put out the fire? They used to call the Indians uh, uh, relief pitchers the kerosene crew because they didn't put out the fire. They threw oil on it. They, <laughs> they threw gasoline on it, you know? And, and all of a sudden, one nothing, Indians turned into 5-1 Yankees like that. And you'd lose. And I learned you cannot, especially when you're like playing against the Yankees, who always have the best hitters. You cannot mess around and take that pitcher out if he's going good. You yeah. cannot. You're going to lose. They're going to kill the next guy. That's what the 100 pitch count is now. Again, it's blurring the lines because they just take the guy out. And the minute you take him out, boom. As a matter of fact, Garrett Cole, it's funny. Garrett Cole was pitching the other day, first game of the year. And he had 55 pitches in the third inning. And you know what came to mind? The, the Jeter days, because Garrett's a star. I'm sitting there going, hmm. And this is the third inning, Rob. I kid you not. I go, Yanks are going to lose this game. And because he's got 55, they're going to take him out in the fifth or the sixth inning. And Toronto can hit like the Yankees could in the old days. As soon as they take him out, they're going to get the next guy. You think in the sixth inning he didn't give up a home run? They took him out. And then the next guy comes in and Toronto racks the guy. Of course. That's one thing no one talks about. When you, when you shoot too many threes, you blow a game in basketball. When you take the pitcher out in baseball, too soon, you lose the game. You've got to have a feel for it. It's not all about stats. And that's why analytics stinks. And that's why too many stats stink. stink. And that's what who was trying to say. You know, I mean... They're not, they're not um, in sync, and people don't seem to know their role. It's just like with the players, two-way players. When we were kids, everybody played two ways. It was the only way to play. You know, that was and the game. <laughs> that was the game. You play offense sometimes. You play defense sometimes. That's how it goes. <laughs> baseball, you get Welcome the hit. to basketball. Yeah, right. right. And, and baseball, we were little kids. Can I, I always wanted to hit first. I, don't, I never wanted to play the field. You got to play the field first. I go, mm, okay. <laughs> you know, but that's, that's the game. You, you, they're not teaching the game. And I just think I've never in my life, I've never seen so many bad coaches at every level. And they're teaching. If you teach somebody the wrong way, but when they're little, they're going to think it's the right way. And they're going to take that their whole life. And they're going to argue it. So that, that goes back to the argument I made with you in the beginning. You know, just, you don't think it's wrong. I do. Because you got to say, hey, that's dumb. Stop doing it. You know, I know you think it's right personally, but it's not. Two and two is not five, no matter how many times you say it is. So that's really what it is. And that's what Pooh was trying to say, you know. And I don't think we're going to get Pooh back on uh, today, folks. So No, it doesn't look that way. So I think uh, we'll call it there and stay tuned. Uh, we'll probably get Pooh on another time as well. And uh, more guests are coming, more coming. Like and subscribe. Keep watching. Spread the word, too, folks. You yeah, look, if you like what you're spread. seeing, just tell everyone you know. Just throw it out there. Throw a link. Uh, the more, the merrier, because this thing is going to blow up, and it's going to blow up with your help and your views and your likes and subscribes. Yes, it so, is. So uh, anything else to say, Bob, before we close shop? <clears throat> yeah, we. I got a text message during this show. And as I said before, and Jamal Wilkes wants to come on on Thursday or Friday. So we're going to have him one of those two days. And we're going to have another show tonight with Toby Bailey if he gets, uh, if he gets a, a free moment. I know he's a little busy right now. But he does say he wants to come on. And he was you know, a freshman of the year at UCLA. And he was a big star in the Final Four in 95 the last time we won it. And he was a monster dunker. Oh, boy, can he dunk. And now he's a sports agent. So I think you want to hear what he has to say about the tournament and his career, and uh, we just keep getting them, so please keep listening. You got it. So stay tuned. We might have another one for you today, folks. Yeah. Signing off with the sports show.